This video is all about engagement and online courses. So compared to in person, how difficult is it for students to engage in online courses and online course material? Most people think it's much harder or somewhat harder for students to engage that way. And students have said the same thing. In this video, we'll work to define student engagement identify some teaching approaches that encourage engagement in the online environment and consider strategies for realizing these approaches in your course. First of all, let's define engagement. There are three dimensions of engagement that we'll be thinking about today. Emotional engagement is a feeling of belonging, connection, and motivation in a course. And it's foundational and fundamental for students to be able to engage in other ways in the course. Behavioral engagement are the things that we can see students doing. It's about their attention, their participation, the action they actually take while they are in the course. And then cognitive engagement is really about what they're learning. And we want them to engage deeply on a cognitive level. We want them to make connections and synthesize what they're learning. We're gonna talk about four teaching approaches that can help you facilitate your students' engagement on the online classes. Now we recognize that it's ultimately up to the students to engage in a course, and there, but there are certainly things as instructors that we can do that will facilitate engagement or that can hinder engagement. So let's talk about the things that we can do that will facilitate engagement. We'll talk about humanizing your course, communicating with clarity and consistency, removing any barriers that might exist to the content in your course, and fostering community. First, let's talk about humanization. If your relationship with your students is very formal and strictly business, if you're really unaware of your students' lives outside of your course, and if your students never hear from you outside of scheduled class meetings, then working to humanize your course a little bit more might be something that you can do to improve engagement in your course. Humanizing your course is really all about facilitating students' emotional engagement. When your course is really humanized, the messages that you'll send to your students include, real humans are welcome here. This means that they don't have to bring their perfect selves. They can bring their whole selves to the class. It tells them that you will be a partner in their learning and that you believe that they can do it and you're really there to help. It tells them that you want to know how that you can support them and that their experiences and their values matter in your course. Some humanizing strategies include using informal video. So if you find that your students don't really hear from you outside of your scheduled class meetings, using some informal video that you post in your Moodle sessions can really go a long way to humanizing and showing your presence on a regular basis to students. The key really here is informal video. So when you make an informal video, it's not polished, it's not perfect, um, it's not you know something that's really highly produced. It's probably something that you are recording on your phone um, in whatever setting it might be. It could be your yard or your car or your office, or your neighborhood, and just having a place for students to see you outside of the classroom really helps them to see you as a real person and makes you more relatable. You can also share something about yourself. And so you may be doing this through the location that you use in your informal video, but it could also just be stories that you tell about your academic journey. Um, it could be selective vulnerability where you open up about something that you struggle. And it's really important for students to see successful, smart people struggling because they struggle as well. And they need to know that that doesn't mean they're not smart or won't be successful. Checking in with your students builds awareness and a sense that you care about them. So, you know, doing some checking in with their um, emotional well-being, their stress levels is really important. And then life flex options refer to the idea that, yes, you have some deadlines and those deadlines are important and there's a reason for those deadlines. But if a student has some really major thing that happens outside of their class that is really um, much more urgent than perhaps their homework. So think about a sick child or having to pick up an extra shift at work because they can't buy their groceries or just something that's really outside of their control. Um, or it could just be their own health or mental health, that you're willing to be flexible with them and you tell them that upfront. We have deadlines, 
Um, they're important. But if you need more time, I am here to help you. I'm here to support you. I can work with you. The second teaching approach that is important for engagement is to make sure that you're communicating with clarity and consistency. So this might be a barrier to your students' engagement if you find that they're often asking about due dates or where to find things or just really questioning things about the logistics of the course. Maybe that hasn't been communicated clearly to them. If they often seem, what, um, seem confused about what's expected of them in the course or surprised when they get their grades back. And also, if they never tell you how appreciative they are of the organization of your course. We have often found that faculty whose courses are very organized, they hear that from students, and students really appreciate that. Some high-impact strategies, if you feel like this might be an area where you could use some work, include orienting your students really early to your course. And this all has to do with uh, um, how you start your students off in your class. Things like a screencast video of your Moodle, where you give them a little tour and tell them where everything could be found. Sending them a welcome letter, having a course overview front and center, having a get started section in the Moodle so that you really tell them ahead of time a lot of the things that they need to know. Then as you go through the course, using a very consistent and effective Moodle layout and organization is important. We do have a Quick Start course shell that's available, but even if you don't want to use our Quick Start course shell, you may find it um, useful to take a look at it and see what we mean about a consistent and effective Moodle layout and adopt some of those principles. The idea really is that as students go through your course and move from modular unit to modular unit, they are able to really know how things are going to be laid out and exactly where to find things, and they aren't having to spend precious energy and time hunting around and emailing you and asking. Sending weekly reminders is also really helpful for students. Yes, you've probably already communicated with them their due dates, but students have a lot on their minds and they have a lot of classes. So sneaking in a little weekly reminder about, hey, here's what's coming up this week, what you should be working on, maybe into your um, regular informal videos that you create every week or in a Moodle announcement is just going to be really helpful to them and save a lot of emails from them later or confusion and late work. Now, if you're finding that your students are um, surprised about their grades that are coming back, it could be that the, def the grading criteria and how you're really evaluating their work isn't clear to them. So using rubrics and other tools to really make it clear exactly what you're looking for is important. And then also providing more regular feedback on their learning, where you are telling your students, you know, this is, ex this is how you're doing. Um, you might want to work on this a little bit more. This can be automatic feedback through self-checks in Moodle and other types of interactive tools that grade students' uh, work um, automatically. It could be personalized feedback on Moodle assignments and other tools. It could be collective feedback that you send along with those weekly reminders where you say, hey, everyone seems to be struggling a little bit with this. If this sounds like you, come to my office hours and let's talk about what's happening because it's going to be really important for you to understand in order to succeed on the, on the course and meet the learning objectives of the class. Another teaching approach that is really important for making sure students can fully engage in your course is removing any barriers to content. So if you seem to think that your students find the content uninteresting, or if they seem to have trouble getting through readings and videos, or if they have tried to get through those things or have done so, but they really can't seem to grasp the concepts or the content in your course, it might be worth looking to see if there's some barriers to the content that you could remove, or if you could smooth the path to their engagement with content. So first of all, we want to make sure that students aren't finding your class and your, your content uninteresting. Now, if they have a hard time understanding why it should make a difference to them or why they should learn it, then that's really going to have, um, hinder and create a barrier to them being interested. So you can tell them why. Maybe you're, maybe you're teaching a gen ed class and some students don't feel that it's relevant, but you can talk about why it is relevant and what learning... Um, and thinking skills that they're developing through this process and how that's going to help them in whatever they do. You can also offer choices. So anytime that students have agency and autonomy, they're going to be a lot more interested in what they can do. So this might be choices in the topic for an assignment. It might be choices in how they can 
access the material, whether they can watch a video or whether they can read a paper. It might be choices in how they show their learning. So you might say, you can write a paper, you can do a presentation, you can create a video, you can create an infographic. So just offering them choices is going to recruit some interest for them. You also want to check your materials for inclusivity. So if a student is looking through your content and isn't seeing anyone like them represented in your content, your content may be sending a message to them that, you know, there is, there is a certain type of person who succeeds in this area and they may feel that they're not that type of person. So just making sure that you're offering a diverse perspectives in your content um, and, a, and diverse people <laughs> in your content so that all students in your course feel that they are um, represented in the content that you provide. Bringing in real world examples and applications also just makes the, the content more interesting by oftentimes sort of converting the delivery of the content and the information into a story. Or really, again, showing the importance of it and, and why it's, uh, rel it could be relevant to them. Now, beyond recruiting interest, um, you know, you, you've got to get your students to get through the content. And sometimes that's difficult to do, especially if, if the content is really long, if it's very text heavy, if it's, you know, a whole lot of readings and not a lot of other types of content, or if it's just, um, you know, doesn't have any active learning opportunities in it. So there are strategies that you could use to make sure that your students are able to get through the content is to enhance the digital accessibility. And digital accessibility makes content more accessible to everyone and not just when you receive a letter from the DRO that says that you must provide an accommodation for a particular student. So for instance, when you provide captions or transcript for a video, all students can use that and benefit from that. And if, it's, if there's material in there that's pretty dense, being able to read it and listen to it at the same time can really help with students' attention. Adding another form of media is also a really important way to help students get through content. Again, this has to do with choice. If you've got a given piece of content that is in more than one format, students have a choice about how they're going to access that content. But also just having some videos and some readings and some podcasts, the variety itself is going to help students um, not get bored. Chunking information is really important. So this means that instead of offering, say, a 30-minute video on a topic, you might offer three 10-minute videos where you've really broken it up into sections that students could listen to one 10-minute video, maybe participate in an active learning exercise or some sort of self-check about that, or even just take a break and process that information before they listen to the next video. And providing opportunities for active learning is really important. So students are not passively just passively listening to or consuming content, but they're actually processing it as they go through the content. Some high impact strategies to help with comprehension. So maybe you feel like your students are adequately interested and they seem to be getting through the content, but they just aren't getting it. So one thing we have to recognize is that um, experts, there's a, there's a documented sort of um, phenomenon called the expert blind, blind spot, which is where when we have spent years and years and we develop our expertise in an area, we, we sort of take the framework that we've built over time for granted. So we don't even really recognize how um, important the, the overall concept and um, scaffolding inside of our heads is to the material that we, that we are teaching. So for a student, they have not yet built this conceptual framework of the discipline. And so their pieces of information are still sort of randomly placed bits of content inside their heads that don't have connections between them. So what this means is that they're not really seeing how it all fits together. They don't know yet. So as an instructor, you can help them by really explicitly highlighting patterns and critical features and big ideas and relationships between things and not assuming that they're going to understand that. This is really going to maximize transfer and generalization of that information to the next course that they take or the next unit in your course. And the other piece, too, is making sure that, you know, maybe your course has a prerequisite or maybe it assumes some prerequisite knowledge from high school 
but maybe students don't necessarily have all of the prerequisite knowledge that you expect them to have. So really providing some vocabulary support and some information where it's like, hey, if you if this is a little bit rough for you and you need to go back and review this fund, this um, foundational concept because this isn't making sense, here's a way to do it. And offering that for students is really helpful. And the last teaching approach to helping with engagement that we'll talk about today is fostering some community in your course. Now, if your course community really is good and healthy and facilitates engagement, then you can see that when your students support each other and they carry on really productive discussions, if you have discussions in your course, or if you have group work that they're really collaborating well together. And these are all really important for students in several ways and for all three areas of engagement. So if students are feeling supported by each other and a sense of belonging in their community, then their emotional engagement is heightened. When students feel that the other students are counting on them to be a, a, an active member in the learning community and contribute, the, that accountability can help with their behavioral engagement and the actions that they take. And then just hearing different perspectives from different students really helps with cognitive engagement and they're able to really deepen their understanding of the material. Some strategies for fostering community. You really want to make sure you're modeling and respecting inclusivity and netiquette. And so you want to make sure that you're sort of being very explicit about your expectations and also just showing what it means to be an, a respectful and inclusive member of a community. You want to make sure that you give students some time to get to know each other as people. So ha let them introduce themselves and say things about themselves that are um, that are not necessarily content related. So you know, it could be about their musical taste or their favorite animal or their pet or where they're from or something in their hometown. You know, invite them to bring in uh, personal experience and personal background when they're discussing the, cl the class content. This is really going to help them to sort of create bonds and get to know each other as people outside of each other as, you know, fellow students in your course. As far as discussions go, if you're using something like Moodle forums, you want to make sure that you are facilitating quality discussions by trying as much as possible to mimic a very authentic in-person discussion. So in a classroom, we would never say, here's a question, every single person needs to answer the question out loud. So that's not a discussion, right? That's, that's answering a question. So think about how real discussions happen in a much more organic way and people are bringing in their own perspectives and people are bringing in their own experiences and try to figure out ways to mimic that in a Moodle forum. You could also set up a debate in a forum, which is another way to do things, or have different people read different things and bring those perspectives into the conversation in your Moodle forums. We have an entire uh, workshop on Moodle forums that um, could give you much more um, specific examples of things that you could do. And if you're teaching in Zoom and you're using breakout rooms, you also want to make sure that you are maximizing the effectiveness of those times and those discussions and, make, and do things like giving students really specific prompts for their discussion, places to record what's going on in the breakout room, and um, giving them some time to sort of, you know, break the ice and, and make sure that those discussions are really being facilitated well. And we have a teaching resources page on some um, good practices for breakout room discussions. If group work is a part of your course, you would want to make sure that you are providing parameters and team roles. Um, both of the parameters that you set and the assigning roles to your team really helps to clarify for students exactly what their responsibilities are. Incorporating peer evaluation and making it really clear how your peers are going to be evaluating each other and how those evaluations may or may not play into your um, grade for the product that you present. And having some team contract for students. So recognizing that like students don't necessarily know how to work together on teams. Yes, they've probably had experience doing so in high school, but has anyone ever really sat down and given them some direct instruction on how to work together as a team? So you may think that that might be something that can help. If this is a really important part of your learning uh, outcomes either for your course or if you think that it's a really important skill that students in your uh, discipline need to know, taking some time to be very explicit about, you know, here's how we work together effectively as a team 
because you want to make sure that that's a positive experience for everyone in addition to a good um, learning opportunity. So once again, we have discussed four different really important teaching approaches that can help with engagement in your online course. We've talked about ways to humanize your course, the importance of communicating with clarity and consistency for student engagement, how barriers to content can create sort of a pinch point for student engagement and how you might remove those, and the importance of fostering community in your course. Each one of these teaching approaches touches on what are more types of engagement, whether it helps students feel more emotionally engaged, whether it helps to keep them on task and doing the things that they need to do, or whether it really helps them to make those important connections and think critically at a high level about your course content. I hope this video has been helpful for you. We do have a workshop on this topic that goes through this information, and there is a teaching resources page as well that um, goes into each of these teaching approaches and the strategies in detail and offers lots and lots of additional um, content and information and helpful resources and examples for each of them.